our pastors do that exercise video up there, but no, no, I don't think so. Hey, let me welcome everybody to all of, at all of our campuses to the second week of our series of messages that we're calling Love Handles. Uh, we're trying to get a handle on relationships. And can I just say, just a little housekeeping thing, I want to thank you for not leaving before our services are over. Uh, I know it's a high priority to beat the Baptist to the Cracker Barrel. I understand that. <laughs> But you know, last week on Mother's Day, we surprised all the ladies in our church with a special VIP area that we set up for them. Chocolate fountains, fresh strawberries, lots of love for all the moms and the spiritual moms in our, in our church. And everybody who left during the invitation missed it because we just kept it for a surprise. So can I just say, you know, here at Compassion, please don't, uh, you know, don't think that the service ends with the sermon or whatever. Uh, we try to plan these services to be meaningful all the way to the end. So don't be a distraction, you know, during the, com connect, the, the commitment time for somebody who's really trying to do business with the Lord. Uh, and don't leave early so you, you miss something. Now today, we're trying to get a handle on relationships because the quality of our relationships is what makes life really good or really tough for all of us. And this week, I want to talk primarily to single people about how to find the love of your life, which I think is the second most important decision any of us will ever make. I think the most important decision you will make in your lifetime is about whether or not you will pursue a relationship with Jesus. Friends, nothing will affect your life now and in the future like that decision, and you'll have an opportunity to make that decision uh, today if you haven't made it yet. After that, whether you get married or not, and who you marry is the one decision that will have the biggest impact on the quality of your life. Now, certainly you don't have to get married to have a great life. Uh, Sarah and I were both single until we were 27 years of age. Let me tell you, single life was very, very good for me. I loved it. I don't have to remind you that Jesus was single. Single life certainly worked for him. You may not realize this, but the Apostle Paul, who wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else, said that being single was a gift. It's an advantage, he said. He said, when you're single, you don't have to deal with all the drama of marriage. So you have more time to serve God because you don't have the responsibility of serving a spouse. He contended that life is just simpler when you're single. However, I read a lot of research this week that indicates that within the next five to seven years, a super high percentage of all of the single people who are in this room today, and we have a lot of single people in our church, uh, a high percentage of you will marry in the next five to seven years. 90% of the adults in America eventually marry because though being single is good, it's also hard. Uh, even God said in Genesis 2, verse 18, it's not good for a man to be alone, so I will make a helper fit for him. Apparently, the drama of marriage, along with the drama of marriage, also comes the hope of intimacy and friendship and partnership in life that often produces children and grandchildren and a world-changing legacy. And friends, that is a dream that most people in our world want to enjoy. Now, last week I was in Poland uh, and this is Sarah and Daniel Varzhenyuk standing in front of the school that our church built because of our one campaign contributions. It's awesome. There are hundreds of kids being blessed here every day. Thank God for your generosity. It's being felt around the world, around the world. But while I was in Poland, this woman right here, Jabba is her name, told me that in Eastern Europe, they actually have department stores for single people where you can buy a husband. And at the store's interest, there's a sign that gives the, the store policy. The first rule states that you can only enter the store one time. There are six floors, and on each floor you can choose a husband, or you can ele elect to move to the next floor and see if you get a better deal. But you can only visit a floor one time other than leaving the building. 
So this woman walks on the first floor and a sign says men with jobs. And she's like, wow, that sounds good to me. <laughs> then she goes on to the second floor, men with jobs that adore children. She's like, ooh. Then she moves to the third floor and a sign says wealthy men who adore children and are very handsome. And she thinks to herself, this is such a great deal. But I just got to see what's on the fourth floor. And on the fourth floor was wealthy men that adore children and are very handsome and help with the household chores. And she's amazed at how things are improving. So she decides to move on to the fifth floor where the sign says wealthy men that adore children, very handsome, help with household chores and are very romantic. And she's about to make her purchase, but she just can't resist the temptation to see what's on the sixth floor. And when she finally gets up there, there's a sign that says you are visitor number 31,456,012 to this floor. There are no men on this floor. This floor exists to prove that it is impossible to please some women. <laughs> now, across the street from that store is another store that sells women. And the first uh, sign on the first floor says, women who are great cooks. Uh, on the second floor, the sign says, great looking women who are great cooks. The sign on the third floor says, good looking women who are great cooks and love sex. And no single man has ever visited the fourth floor. <laughs> now, it would be nice if finding the love of your life was that simple, right? But we know it's not. Maybe that's why a single friend of mine posted this picture on Instagram last week. Happiest day of my life. That's me fishing in the background. <laughs> I know a lot of godly women that would kill that man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Now, uh, friends, Sarah and I have had one of those marriages that has made life better in almost every imaginable way. Our marriage has not been easy. It certainly has not been perfect because I've been involved in it. But when we got married, we made a vow to love each other for life. And let me tell you about our marriage. Our marriage has been better and worse. It's been richer and poorer. It's been in sickness and health. Our marriage has been all that and anybody else who's had that experience, just say amen. amen. That's how marriage works. Our marriage has also produced more blessing in my life than any other relationship other than my relationship with the Lord. But let me tell you, it didn't start out that way. The first time I met Sarah, she was rooming with an old girlfriend of mine. And I broke up with this girl on the night she thought we were getting engaged. <laughs> Apparently, I was not a very strong communicator back in the day. <laughs> Or I just procrastinated on breaking off that sorry relationship a lot longer than I should have. Either way, uh, my old girlfriend went forward with a dim impression of me. And she shared that with Sarah and all the girls in that dorm many times. <laughs> so right before I was introduced to Sarah by a friend of ours, she told our friend, I know this guy. I've heard of him. He's a creep and I'm not talking to him. But eventually she did. And two years later, we got married, and we're going to celebrate our 37th anniversary in August. Now, th <clears throat> thank the Lord for Sarah. Love that girl. But here's the question. How do we get from he's a creep to where we are today, 36 years later, better friends than ever before, house full of kids and grandkids that we love who love us? I mean, the big question is, how do you find somebody who will take, not just take that trip with you, but make that trip with you. Now, I read this week that over 40 million Americans are using online dating services to find that person. Now, when Sarah and I met in 1981, the internet didn't even exist, except in the mind of Al Gore, its inventor, <laughs> according to him. <clears throat> I read this week that eHarmony.com gets 10,000 signups a day. And Match.com is bigger than eHarmony. There are dating sites for Ivy Leaguers who want to find another Ivy Leaguer. Uh, there's JDate for Jewish people who are trying to find somebody Jewish to date. You know, you got findthedate.com, rent a date, dump a date. I mean, it's all out there, right? <laughs> people are trying to use technology to, to find the love of their life. I heard of a widow who was just crying over a container of ashes. She just wept and said, he was my fourth husband. And a beautiful, fast-track professional woman who had never married rolled her eyes and said, can you believe that? She's got husbands to burn, and I can't find just one. <laughs> Dating has changed, and it's more complicated than ever before. And for many of you who are single today, and we have a lot of single people in our church, and thank God we love you, love you, love you. You need to get real clear on what God's Word has to say about who to marry 
before you swipe right. You with me? Hmm? If you don't know what that is, ask your grandchildren. Because no matter how you meet, tapping into the wisdom and guidance and advice that the Bible offers will help you select the right person. But friends, that doesn't make it really simple either, to be honest with you. That, that's not so simple either. For example, the most famous romantic story in the Bible, I think, is found in Genesis 24. So open your Bible to Genesis 24. This is about the story of Isaac and Rebekah, and it is a great story about an arranged marriage. Now, how many of y'all think we should go back to back? Only parents raising their hands right now. I get that, okay? <clears throat> it's about an arranged marriage. Man, Isaac, uh, Isaac's daddy, Abraham, was just crazy about him, loved him. And Abraham and Sarah had struggled with infertility all their marriage until in old age, as a miraculous gift from God, man, Sarah got pregnant and Isaac was born and they were just thrilled. And so when the time came for Isaac to get married, Abraham thought, I am going to help my boy out. I am going to arrange an amazing marriage for him. So he sends his most trusted servant on a long trip back to their homeland where people believe what we believe to find a bride for his favorite son. Now talk about pressure. How'd you like to be given the responsibility by your boss to find a spouse for your boss's child? But that's what this employee has to do. And so he lines up 10 camels and he creates a caravan and off he goes to the far country so he can find a bride for Isaac. Now he's praying all the way for a divine sign. Lord, I, I need a vision from heaven that will tell me this is the woman to choose for Isaac. And so as he's praying, he gets back to Abraham's homeland and he's praying, uh, God, I'm going to go to this well and I'm going to watch the young women of the village come out to this well and get water. And if any of them offers to water my camels for me, I'm going to take that as a sign from heaven that this is the one for Isaac. And you know, single people still kind of pray those prayers, right? You know, Lord, I'm going to Kroger <laughs> and I'm going to hang out in the produce department. <laughs> and if anybody hangs around on kumquat, kumquats for 30 seconds, that's going to be the one, right? And I'm not sure that's how it works, but that's what's happening in this story. All right. This employee does this, and I'm telling you, when Abraham's guy finishes this prayer, the minute he opens his eyes, this drop-dead gorgeous girl walks up named Rebecca, and he says, ma'am, would you help me get a drink? And she's like, well, I'll be glad to. Can I, can I water your camels for you as well? And he said, what? Now, that's not in the text, but when we get to heaven, <laughs> you watch the video, you'll see that's what he said. But anyway, he's like, dude, this is the sign I've been looking for, and, and, and thank God, you know, the more he learned about her, the better he likes her. That's the kind of person you want to marry, right? Where the more you learn about them, the better you like them. I mean, she's from Isaac's people. She believes in the same God. Spiritually, she's on the same track. Man, that was the number one qualification that Abraham gave his God. You, this girl's got to follow God. She's got to believe in our God. And she's got a strong moral, moral fiber. She's a, a beautiful young woman, but she's a virgin. She's kept herself sexually pure. She's got this depth of character. She's pleasant. She's got a great work ethic. She seems to be <coughs> such a well-adjusted single person. And best of all, she is available and ready to relocate. Listen, she's remarkable. You read this story. She packed all her stuff and was ready to travel with no advance notice in one day. How many women you know can do that? All right, I'm just saying, all right? Now, the Bible goes on to describe how Isaac and Rebecca met. And I mean, it's like a scene from a romantic movie. She's riding a camel back to where Isaac and his family live on this big ranch. In verse 64, Rebecca and Isaac get their first glimpse of each other. He's been off on a business trip. He's just come home. He's out in the, uh, on the field watching the sunset, glad to be back home, eager for his servant's return. He looks up. Here's my dad's caravan. Wait a minute. That's the guy they sent out for my wife. So he starts walking in that direction. Rebecca looks up. She sees Isaac, puts a veil over her face, gets down off the camel. She turns to the servant and says, who is that hunka, hunka, burning love? Now, that's just my translation of the Hebrew text right there, all right? But I mean, she's like, who is that? And he said, that's Isaac. And I mean, it's romantic and electric and the sparks are flying. It's like love at first sight. And Abraham's servant is watching all of this. And you know what he's thinking? Whoo, <laughs> close, that's awesome. And then the Bible says everything just starts clicking. And in verse 67, Isaac brings Rebecca into his mother's tent and she becomes his wife. And he loved her so much and she loved him so much. And they lived happily ever after for the rest of their lives. What a beautiful story, right? Except I added that happily ever after part. That is not in the Bible. Truth is, Isaac and Rebecca had a terrible marriage. 
Their marriage was plagued with problems. Consequently, they lived under almost constant stress. I mean, they loved each other, but they had very different ideas about how marriage was supposed to work and what the roles were in family and, and how the power worked and all of that kind of stuff. And then they made the worst mistake any parent can make. They showed partiality to their kids. You know, they just didn't have a handle on values in their marriage. And so Rebecca, you know, shows partiality to the baby of the family, even when he's a grown man. And, you know, that fills the family with manipulation and, and bred distrust and resentment between the brothers and just shatters the family. And many of y'all have lived through that. You know what that can do to a family. Don't do it to yours. You know, this happens because they never got a handle on how they're going to raise their kids together. Consequently, they actually work against each other. And then that conflict comes to a head when their sons are men and they never learn how to communicate in this family and nobody ever talks any problems out. So they're not able to talk about it or ask for or extend forgiveness. They don't know anything from their family about how to reconcile relationships. So the family just blows up. Now listen, Isaac and Rebecca did a lot right, but they still had a very challenging relationship. Now in our country, from childhood, many of us have been exposed to this myth of people falling in love at first sight and riding off into the sunset and living happily ever after, you know. But from that point, you don't see the job pressure. At that point, you don't see the bills, the dirty diapers, the exhaustion, the morning breath, the emotional scars, the medical emergencies that are going to dog everybody in this world for the rest of their lives. You know, somebody said that marriage is like getting a phone call in the middle of the night. First you get the ring, and then you wake up, you know, <laughs> thinking, what happened? Now, Isaac and Rebecca prayed for somebody to marry, and God answered their prayers. And they did a lot right, and we can learn from that today, but they still need to get a handle on how to actually love each other, and we can learn from that too. Now, the thing I hope single people will learn from this is right here at the beginning of the story. When you think about who to marry, you ask your parents, how will I know it's the one? What, what do they say? If they're stupid, they say, you'll just know. The dumbest thing a smart person has ever said to a child, you'll, oh, just follow your heart, follow your emotions. Like pizza is going to pick you the right man. It's stupid. This story is going to tell you what you should say. When your child comes to you and says, how will I know it's the right one? Abraham is very specific with his servant about the kind of person that Isaac needs to marry. And I'm sure Isaac was involved in that conversation because in the story, he's standing out in the field waiting on the servant to come back with Wonder Woman. But get this man, Isaac wasn't just walking into the gym or the office or Kroger or the club, looking around at the outside, hoping to get struck by marriage lightning. There's a certain kind of person that his family taught him to believe would make for a great marriage partner. And he was taught our family doesn't negotiate. And single people, you shouldn't negotiate either. Now, this is the point where typically the married people all check out on a sermon like this. You know, you think, ah, I'm already married. I can zone out. I got this. This doesn't apply to me. Whoa, you could not be more wrong. If Isaac and Rebecca had kept their eye on the ball where they were strong and paid attention to these areas where they were weak and got a handle on that, they could have avoided a lot of the pain that just dogged their marriage. So let's use this story to get a handle on the kind of person we should be looking for if we're single and the kind of person we're hoping to grow into if we're married. Number one, pray for a partner who is spiritually compatible. Everybody say spiritually compatible. Come on spiritually compatible. I prayed for this over my kids and my grandkids since the day they were born. I prayed for their wives. I prayed their wives to be godly women, be raised by godly parents. I prayed for this for my kids and their wives since the day they were born. By the way, did I mention I have a new uh, grandbaby that was born while I was in Poland? I know y'all would want to see little uh, Stone Royal Huxford right here. I've, I've already prayed for his wife. And I know she's in the world somewhere because Huxford's, we like the older women. And so she's already around somewhere. And I'm just saying, all right. <laughs> You know, there is one verse in the New Testament that has gotten more single people mad at me than any other verse in the Bible. And I don't know why you're mad at me. I didn't write it. I'm just a mailman. All right. Second Corinthians 6, 14. Let's read it all together. Big voice. Single people. 
Single people, read this with me, come on. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. This verse is basically saying to us the same thing that Abraham said to his servant when he sent him out to find a bride for his son. Don't bring any woman back here who doesn't feel the same way about God that we do. Now, the reason single people don't like this verse is, dude, it really reduces the playing field, right? But friends, the Bible is so clear on how agreement on this one value can really protect your future. Do not even think about marrying somebody who doesn't agree with you on the fundamental values of your life. Now listen, when Sarah and I were single, one of the things that we agreed on before we even met each other is that we weren't looking for some Christian who goes to church. I mean, good night, monkeys go to church. We're not looking for somebody who's going to give God a nod every Easter and Christmas. We wanted somebody who was compatibly strong. Somebody who loved Jesus with the same intensity that we did. Because man, when you get a handle on this, it affects almost everything about your marriage. Man, your faith affects how you think and behave and love and the way you handle money and, and, and how you plan to use your spare time and how you choose your close friendships. It, it changes how you see weekends. I mean, especially Sunday morning and Wednesday nights, how are you going to spend that? Man, your faith should affect, you know, when you choose to serve in the church and how you choose to serve the poor. It affects your ability to forgive and be patient and show compassion and love generously. I mean, everything. Now, sometimes two people marry and one becomes a believer, and then you're married to an unbeliever, you're unequally yoked, and let me tell you, the Bible gives instructions for how to, how, how to bring blessing in that situation. Or maybe you, you ignored this value, or, or you just didn't know about it, and you, you're married to an unbeliever, and listen, the Bible tells us how to bless them too, and we'll get a handle on that in the next weeks to come in the series. But friend, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is not some little thing that you do. This relationship is the core of your identity. It affects everything. And being on the same page spiritually is a joy multiplier for your marriage. And if you're not, you are going to struggle with areas in your relationship where you will never have the kind of unity you could if you were married to somebody with whom you were spiritually compatible. Now, I talk to people all the time who say, Cam, I know my little friend is not a believer yet, but she is good looking, bro. And I think God is going to use me to lead her to Jesus. Really? Missionary dating? Got it. Heard of that. Listen, we've all heard of enough stories of that actually working out to hope it works for you. But you know, lightning strikes you about every 10,000 times, right? Now, while you're considering giving your heart to someone who does not believe what you believe, just imagine how it could work out. Imagine being married to somebody who cannot relate to, much less celebrate, your core identity. I mean, being married to somebody who wonders why you would waste your time worshiping God. Why do you always want to stop and pray before we eat? Why would you spend so much time studying a book that they think is archaic and irrelevant to them? Or why, why do you get upset when we don't raise our kids according to this? Why do you make such a big deal about it while I'm on a business trip and I violate what this teaches? Why would you care so much about what's going on at your church or, or want to serve there or, or give to the lighthouse or be a part of a compassion project or tithe or whatever? Now, friends, for every time that missionary dating thing works out, there's about 10,000 believers who go to bed every night with a person that they love more than anybody in the world, knowing they are one heart attack away from never seeing them again. Single friends, follow the example of Abraham and Isaac and Rebecca. Don't negotiate on spiritual compatibility. Look for somebody who is just as serious about Jesus as you are. In addition, I would encourage you to look for a partner who has a track record of character. Char Everybody say character. Yeah. Character. Have you ever heard the old saying, <laughs> and there are variations of this saying, that if somebody tells you you're a donkey, you ought to ask yourself, why do they say that? And if two people tell you you're a donkey, you ought to look in the mirror. And if three people tell you you're a donkey, you ought to buy a saddle. Now, if you're dating somebody and they lie to you about some little thing, you ought to ask yourself, why'd they do that? I mean, why, would they, why would they lie about where they are? I got to find my friend on my phone. I know where you are. Why would you lie about something so silly? Don't call it a mistake. It's, don't give them an excuse. They lied. You know it. They know it. Why in the world would you lie about something little like that? 
Second time they lie to you, you should look in the mirror. You're dating a liar. You are dating a liar. You're dating somebody who doesn't value telling the truth. Telling the truth seems inconvenient to them sometimes, so they just lie. Third time they lie to you, you should face the fact that you are saddling yourself with a liar for the rest of your life. This is another reason to follow my number one advice to single people, which is go slow. Say it with me, everybody. Go, say it the way I say it now. Go slow. Time is your friend when you're trying to assess the character of the person you're dating. And listen, their character only comes out under pressure. Character always comes out most visibly under pressure. So don't fool yourself. If they lack character, pass. You can do better. Being alone would be better than being saddled to a liar for the rest of your life. Friends, character matters. Nothing will destroy a relationship quicker than some trust-shattering half-truths. Man, nothing creates more frustration you know, than realizing that you're dating somebody who doesn't show up when they promise they're going to show up. And they don't always follow through on what they say they're going to follow through on. So when you're dating, any serious breach of character should be flagged and penalized and discussed and resolved before you date any further. Because character matters. Say it with me, everybody. Character matters. Look for it. Wait for it. Celebrate it when it comes. Don't ignore it if it's missing. Number three, dig deep until you understand each other's emotional health. Everybody say emotional health. <laughs> this is another reason to go slow. You know, the only way to tell what kind of emotional health somebody has is to talk, 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 talk about everything they've been through and what they did about it. Now, I saw an old friend last week at church and he and I share a love of flying. I love to fly. He loves to fly. The only difference is he has a license in an airplane and I don't. All right. So the first thing he told me was, hey, man, I, I bought another airplane. I was like, no. And he had one years ago and had to crash land it because of a mechanical failure. And when he crashed that airplane with his wife on board, she encouraged him to quit flying for a while. And my motto is happy wife, happy life. Amen. So he quit flying and then she passed away. She's in heaven now. He's back in the airplane. All right. He got another one just like the one he had before, which is awesome. All right. That's an awesome airplane right there. It's an expensive airplane. Very nice airplane. But this airplane is 23 years old. Doesn't look like it's 23 years old, does it? Now, when you're buying an airplane like this, you, you know, the, the issue is not really how shiny it is or how good it looks when it's sitting on the runway, which is important, right? But before you commit to buy something like this, you want to see the log books because that, that airplane right there has a log book that tells you everything about that aircraft. It tells you how often the oil has been changed. It tells you if it's ever been crashed or, or how bad the crash was or landed really hard or if any cracks occurred. It tells you all of the, the latest mechanical work that was done on that plane. It tells you if the prop ever hit the ground while the engine was running. It tells you everything. And before anybody with good sense buys an airplane like this, dude, they will scour those logbooks before they commit to buying something they might flip in 24 months. Why in the world would anybody commit to marriage before they have talked and talked and talked and talked about the hardest things that have ever happened in your life and what you did about it? We've all been through hard things. Amen. Amen. I say we've all been through hard things. Amen? Amen. We're all dinged up a little bit. We've all taken some damage, but you can tell a lot about a person by how they process that damage. Now, if you have a friend who comes to you so exciting because he's dating this beautiful woman and her parents are divorced because one of them is an alcoholic and the other had really bad anger issues, but my girlfriend went through that whole family mess without a scratch. Your friend is drunk <laughs> or in denial because, friend, nobody goes through that much trauma without a scratch. We need to talk about where those scratches are and how deep those scratches were and how they process that because the pain of that past will definitely affect how your little friend deals with disappointment and hardship in every relationship they are ever in in the future unless they work through it. Now, if you work through it, that's all good. 
But if you don't work through it, <laughs> then you're going to get to work through it with them. Friends, this whole thing about dating and friendship, this is not about marriage. It's about discovering the character and the spiritual strength and the emotional health of this new friend. Right? I say, right? This is what you tell your kid. How will I know? Well, let's talk about their character. Let's talk about their spiritual strength. Let's talk about their emotional health. Tell me about your little friend. In addition, when you're looking for the love of your life, you want to make an assessment of their communication skills. Everybody say communication skills. Okay, I feel like some of y'all are asleep with me here. Communication skills, like lions. Y'all ready? Here we go. Now, when I do premarital counseling, and let me tell you, we will not marry anybody at Compassion who doesn't go through premarital counseling. If you don't care enough to prepare, we will not participate. I'm, I'm just telling you, that's how we roll here at Compassion. But when I do premarital counseling, and in one of those sessions, I will always ask a couple, tell me about your biggest fight. And they're like, fight? <laughs> well, I was on page eight in Bragg's magazine, and he wanted to look at page 100, but that was about the worst one right there. I'm like, you know how it is, man. They don't want to get married. They're not thinking about anything but the good stuff. So I'll say, when's your biggest fight? When somebody says, we really haven't had a fight yet, that's like red flags are going up because you don't know how your partner will react when a line of respect is crossed because you're going to cross lines of respect and you're eventually going to have fights. You kind of want to know how they're going to do that before you get married. I mean, what are they going to do? They're going to blow up. They're going to shut down. They're going to go mute. They're going to get drunk. They're going to run away. What's it going to be? So when a couple tells me we hadn't had a fight yet, I say, all right, go have a big fight. Call me in the morning, (laughs) which is why people don't come to me for counseling. But anyway, (laughs) this is another reason you want to be spiritually compatible. Friends, the Bible contains so much practical wisdom on communication. Here's my favorite verse in the Bible on communication. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word just stirs up anger. Now, friends, when, when your partner gets hot, they lead with that. Do they spew? Do they stew? Or, or, or do they have a gentle way of processing when they're upset? Here's another one, Proverbs 18, 13. Spouting off before listening to the facts is shameful and foolish. How good of a listener is this friend of yours? Did they, they come to every conflict with their mind made up? They gotta be right. Because that pattern won't change just because they say I do to you. That's a personality thing. How about this one? Don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry because anger gives a foothold to the devil. How long will your friend go without talking about what made them angry? And when they talk about it, are they going to blow? Are they going to shut down for a few days, forever? Just never going to talk about it? Let that pressure build, 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 build inside until one day, explosion. Will they initiate a conversation by using the magic phrase of marital communication? Y'all going to owe me, owe me big for this. Here you go. Say it with me, y'all. Help me understand. This is a gentle answer in a tense moment. Help me understand what happened here. Help me understand why you did that. Help me understand what I'm seeing here. Just help me understand. Friends, there's so much great com- wisdom for communication in the Bible. And I'll tell you, whenever I see a courting couple or a married couple who's growing in their ability to communicate, you know what I tell myself? They're going to make it. I bet for them, it's going to be till death do us part. All right, one more. Don't settle for anyone who isn't physically attractive to you. Say physically attractive, everybody. Physically attractive. Now, this is really important. Do you remember, now read this story for yourself. Do you remember when Isaac and Rebecca saw each other and it was like, hot dog. Yes. God, Lord, have mercy. Look at that. I mean, it was like the same way I felt when I saw Sarah for the first time. Have mercy. Yes. That's a good thing. I mean, if you're going to marry somebody, you ought to be physically attracted to them, right? Here's the problem. This is where everybody in our day starts. This is where everybody starts. This is number five. This is where everybody starts in our day. Now, single friends, single friends, high schoolers, students, look at me. The minute you let physical attraction lead you to sexual involvement, you will go blind, deaf, and dumb. Everybody say dumb. Dumb. Especially dumb. Concerning everything else we talked about today. You will quit thinking about all that stuff and all you think about is sex. Listen, you cannot sleep with a person and remain objective about them. You can't do it. 
This is why the Apostle Paul said, among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. This is a single man writing to godly single people. Among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality, which means no sex with anybody you're not married to. It makes you stupid. Don't do it. Your body belongs to your future spouse. That's God's idea. Your body belongs to your future spouse. Save it for them. High schoolers, high schoolers, college students, single people. Let me give you the words to say on the second date. Because on the first date, that's just a checkout ride, right? The second date, something might happen here. So on the second date, wouldn't it be great if you could just say, and I would love to hear guys say this. Wouldn't it be great if, if godly men, when they're dating single women, would just man up and be a spiritual leader? I'm so sick of these pansy Christian guys who pretend to be Christians in this room, and then they walk out and date like everybody else out on the street. Wouldn't it be great if we just had some godly men just man up and on the second date say, hey, I really like you. Now that's called communication. The girl will love that. All right, she'll love that stuff. You're talking about your heart. Good, all right. Just say, I really like you. I had a great time. I really want to get to know you better, so I hope we can go out again. But I just want to tell you, sex will not be a part of our relationship. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm saving myself for the person who marries me. If you want it, you're going to have to put a ring on it. <laughs> Wait a minute. Is that a <laughs> I'm not supposed to, I'm supposed to be in there. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> There's just not going to be any sex in our relationship. So thank you for not pushing me in that way. Because if you push me, I will break this thing off so fast it'll make your head spin. Because I'm saving myself for my husband, my wife, whoever it might be. Now, if you do that, let me tell you what you will hear. What many of the godly single people in our church have heard. They'll hear somebody say, well, we're going to date. Sex is going to be a part of it. To which you should say, you're going to really push me on this thing? I'm just saying. So no delayed gratification for you. You just got to have it when you want it. That's how it is. Here's what you should say next. Now, you sometimes if somebody just gives you the words to say is helpful, right? Here's what you should say next. Thank you. Thank you for telling me this. I could have wasted six months figuring out what a loser you are. You told me on the second date. Thank you. Now, don't ever call me again. Don't ever call. Do you think God would bless that? Do you think God would go, dude, that girl's like Rebecca. I think I'm going to send her a man. Not some little adolescent punk who can't live without sex every time he turns around. I'm going to send her a man. I'm going to send that man a godly woman. He's strong. He deserves one. Somebody pushes you on sex, dump them. Dump them. You're not spiritually compatible with them. And God will bless that. Now listen, I was a virgin when I got married at 27 because thank God I was taught all this by my parents and by my pastor and in my youth group and so was Sarah and so are all of your kids. And I think I could have slept with any one of a dozen girls I dated before I met Sarah. And if I had, God, I might have married one of them and I would have lost so much, so much. Now, if you're already married, we're going to help you get a handle on building a great marriage from where you are right now. But if you're single, let him who has ears to hear, hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. Amen. Let him who has and her who has ears to hear. On the other hand, if you're married, you cannot overestimate the power of a physical relationship in marriage. This is, the, this is the glue. This is the amazing bonding device that God invented to just hold husbands and wives together for 40, 50, 60 years. I mean, it's awesome. I remember being at Sarah's house out in California. We were out there on vacation or something when her parents were in their 70s. And we, we're sitting on the couch watching them in the kitchen and Sarah's dad patted his wife in a way that I'm not sure I should talk about in the pulpit here <laughs> at, at our church. So let me just say that he gave her a little pat and I looked over at Sarah and I went like this and she started giggling and I thought in my mind, girl, this is the home you grew up in. Life is going to be good for me, y'all. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Life, my life is going to be good, y'all. I'm telling you, right? 
Friends, sex is God's wedding gift for the couple. It's awesome. Enjoy it. Always enjoy it. Don't ever quit enjoying it. But don't open it early either. Don't open it early. Now, let me recommend some reading for you if you're single. I, I want to recommend, if you're single, that you read the book Fit to be Taught by Bill and Lynn Hybels. I love this book. I've made everybody I've ever married read this book before I would do the wedding. Uh, it, it is just, all, Bill and Lynn had a very contentious uh, relationship because they're just so opposites. Uh, and, and yet they worked all that stuff out. So they're a great example. It was written in the 90s, but it's still in, in uh, print. It's awesome. Every single person should read that book. Another book, uh, if you get it, and it's out of print, is written by Dr. Neil Clark Warren, who is the founder of eHarmony.com. He is a Christian counselor who wrote Finding the Love of Your Life. All that 29 compatibility uh, matrices that he talks about at e eHarmony, uh, this book is, is all that research before eHarmony was even invented, uh, and their matching algorithm is based on the principles of this book. And if you can get a hold of it, it's awesome. For those of you who are still dating or wish you were, Here's a book I would encourage you to read. Uh, it was written by Dr. Henry Cloud. It's called How to Get a Date Worth Keeping. Now, he wrote this for people who are 30, 40 years old, divorced, never married, whatever it may be. How do, you, how do you find somebody to date? Somebody decent. How do you find them? And Dr. Cloud gives a strategy for dealing with that and getting things moving in a healthy way that I think is really helpful. And so if you're frustrated in that area, if you could get uh, your best friend or your life group and say, hey, I'm gonna read this book, Let's read this together. Y'all help me work through this, and, and I think it would be really helpful for you. Now, as we close, whether you're single or married, let me ask you a couple questions. Number one, how strong are you spiritually? How strong are you spiritually? Are you stronger today than you were two years ago? Are you on a declining orbit? I mean, heading for a crash somewhere? Are, are, have you just dropped off the map? How strong are you spiritually? Is your faith strong? Is it obvious? Is it attractive, whether you're single or married? Is your character bringing glory to God? I mean, I mean, wherever you stride in our community, in the business world, at the gym, wherever, man, is your character giving off those signals to our culture that you're a follower of Jesus, you don't negotiate, bro, I love the Lord, I'm living for the Lord everywhere, all the time, that's how it is. City set on a hill. Is that the way your character is? Are you growing emotionally? I mean, so that your kids... And your friends, my, and my dad grew up in a family with alcoholics, but boy, let me tell you, he has made some changes and it's been a blessing to our family. Are you growing emotionally? Are, are you growing in your communication skills? Are your kids learning from watching y'all how to communicate? Are, are your friends going, whoo, I cannot believe that God turned that conversation that way. D does your physical relationship honor the Lord? Or are you just blending in? What is it? Now, I know this message has been tough for some of us. Some of us have been through divorce. That's why we're single today. You've been through an enormous amount of pain. I just want you to know that divorce does not define you. Divorce does not define you. Let's start today, and we'll start honoring God moving forward. Some of you here today are single. Marriage has just not happened for you yet. I know how frustrating that can be, but I just want to tell you, if you're single, the most miserable people I know are not single. The most miserable people I know are not single. So honor God in this season of life and he will bless you. Remember that God loves you, that past mistakes do not define you. And if you're present, if you're faithful in the present, it will position you for the blessings of God in the future. Father, thank you. Thank you for this time we've had to open your word today. And not just read your word, Lord, but let it read us. And I pray, God, that you will find us humble and teachable and faithful. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.